skills that Keith Smith used in his radio programs on the ABC, but of course he did a lot more too on commercial radio, and it's my great pleasure, I'm very proud to introduce him as our special guest this hour on Remember When. Good evening, Keith. Hello, is that Bruce, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be with us tonight. Yes, uh, this is Philip. Great to talk to you, Keith. We're looking forward to this. Oh, good, good. Keith, you're a, a, a Melbourne boy, aren't you? That's right, yes. I was born in Northcote a long time ago. <laughs> Were you expelled from school at the age of 13? And if so, why? Well, I was expelled because uh, my parents uh, didn't want to pay two guineas a term school fees at the Northcote District High School, and uh, they were meticulous players and everything else, but they felt uh, vaguely that uh, education should be free. It hadn't caught on then, but they were ahead of their time, I think, and so I was asked to leave, and uh, I was out of work for six months. I couldn't get a job. I was too shy to even go and apply for one at 13 and a half, and um, then I got a job, uh, I found it myself, at a foundry. An iron foundry in Northcote, behind the Northcote race course, which was owned by a man named Scott. Thelma Scott, the actress, was her father. Goodness me, that's, that's unusual, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? And uh, I went home black every night. I spent hours at a time inside a hot furnace after casting day and uh, chipping away at iron slag with a, with a hammer and chisel. And um, uh, on the casting day, I walked behind the men with the big crucibles of uh, hot iron, molten iron, cast iron. They made sash weights for windows, and I had to skim the slag off. And, of course, the sparks went everywhere, and I was punctured all over. And it was a terrible time. That sounds... Pretty well, a very tough upbringing, almost Dickensian, Keith. It is really. Ten years later, they wouldn't have tolerated it, but at the time, uh, in the 30s, um, it was just terrible. And uh, But I was lucky to have a job even at ten and sixpence a week. Keith, what's the sign writing uh, part of your life? Well, I got a job. My father, who was a counter jumper, he was on the sales staff at Buckley and Nunn in Burke Street. And he knew Mr. Mentz, an old gentleman of 82, who ran the Palace of Signs at 230 Elizabeth Street. That's just up past the old tin shed. And on the other corner was the post office hotel where Mo Roy Reen used to live sometimes. And this sign writing shop was on the first floor above what we called, no, sacrilege intended, the Catholic doll shop. And, they had, and we were on the first floor. And every man in that sign writing shop, his life, his life was devoted to practical jokes. And they taught me the meaning of laughter. It is the funniest episode of my life. And Mr. Mentz, he was, he was 82. And everyone in the shop could imitate his voice, myself included. And many, many years later after the war, I used that voice when I played Grandpa with Jack Davey. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so that's where the character came from, Keith. Everyone could do it. But um, we, we perfected it, of course, in the Davey show. And uh, uh, I remember, I think it was this morning, a gag with Jack and George Foster and Jack and I were in the, in the show. It was a top show for years. At 2GB, all over Australia, 52 stations, the usual thing. And um, he said to me once, uh, uh, I said, uh, I've got a new girlfriend, Mr. Davey. He said, you're the girlfriend. I said, I'm a glow with love for her. And Davey said, you've left it a bit late in life to be glowing. I said, just because the light's not on, don't think the current's switched off. <laughs> oh, lovely line. Keith, before we get back to those days as Grandpa, just have a little listen to this music and tell us what memories it evokes. <laughs> memories for you there, Keith? But from children. Yes, that's the first time I was aware of you on uh, national radio. The program was aired through 3AR down here in Melbourne, but I'm sure it wasn't your radio debut, was it? No, it wasn't, actually. I was I was a studio manager just before the war at uh, 3UL uh, in Warrigal at uh, £4.10 a week. And I wrote my first, my first situation comedy there using the staff, and you'll never guess what I called it. Crowded house. <laughs> oh goodness me! Years later, uh, yeah. uh, a group. Yes, yes. And I've got you know I've got the rights to the name, really. I suppose. <laughs> How come back in 1940 you were writing material for Bob Dyer? That's right, Bob Dyer. Um, Bob had heard I was a comedy writer, and I went round to 3DB where he was doing "You Ain't Heard Nothing Yet." And comedy writers then were as rare as hen's teeth as they are now. Uh, they're still very rare in Australia, I might add. We won't go into that. But seasoned and professional comedy writers very rare. And um, I joined his staff soon after he married Dolly, and he kept in touch with me right through the war when I was away in the islands. And um, after the war, on Armistice Day, I was in Leigh, I think, 
and he sent a telegram, won't be long now, Pappy, and I joined him after the war and wrote his Can You Take It stunt, so I lived with Bob and Dolly for quite a time. Yeah, you, know, you actually lived uh, as a resident? Yes, with Bob and Dolly at the Grove Mossman. Are you still in touch with Dolly? She's on the Gold Coast these days in retirement. I wrote to Dolly. I'm writing a, 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 my 27th book at the moment called Australia is... Not Australia as it were, that's my 26th. Um, this one's all about... Um, no, it, it, that is, that's right. I get very mixed up, you know. The 26th book was about uh, various facets of Australian life over the last 100 years. People I've interviewed since the 1950s, or during the 1950s, very elderly people, an anecdotal history of Australia. And uh, I wanted some information about Bob, and I wrote to Dahl, but she didn't answer. But when Bob died, I wrote her a note, and she sent me a very nice letter back. I hadn't seen Dolly, we're like brother and sister. I hadn't seen her since um, about 1952. But um, uh, I understand that Dolly's living very quietly now at Surface Paradise and you write to her care of the post office. Keith, from the archives, I'd like to play you something and just get your reminiscences on it and, and memories, good or bad. All right. Have a listen, Keith. <laughs> Welcome to Australia's Top Line Comedy Show! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your very kind welcome this evening. Uh, Foster. Yes, Harry. Uh, you have to introduce me to the mob tonight. Tell them who I am. Who are you? <laughs> I've told you 15 times, I am now the travel advisor for Boeing Boeing Jet Airlines Limited. <laughs> and I'm here to give a lecture on travel. I'm an expert. You know what an expert is? Oh, yes. An expert has been an expert as a long drip. That's you, Harry. <laughs> Oh, it's no use. Grandpa! Yes, son, what do you want? I need somebody to read this opening announcement to this hall full of people. I want them all to travel overseas by Boing Boing Airlines. Well, I'll read it. What is it, son? Here, take it. It says, introducing Harry Durth, travel expert. Yes? And it goes on, he fights the gracious cause, he's fanciful with travel. He fights the gracious cause, he's fanciful with travel. Good, now go out there and say it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen! <laughs> Introducing Harry Durth, travel expert. How's that, Harry? Good. Now, go on, read the rest. Harry Durth, travel expert. He bites off crayfish claws. <laughs> fights the gracious cause, you idiot. Sorry, fights the gracious cause, you idiot. And uh, his pants are filled with gravel. <laughs> Pantable with travel. I'll do your own instructions. There was a little of Laugh Till You Cry, which was heard on 3UZ, I think at 1.30 on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Good, uh, good times, Keith? Yes, they played it so often, they reckon you could put the needle on one side and you get the show on the other. <laughs> the records were worn so thin. Now, I did that after we left Jack, um, George and I left Jack. He had a company with us under very pleasant terms. But we went round to UW and George became the comedy director at UW. And as usual, I wrote the shows. I wrote them with Alexander MacDonald, the well-known journalist, and I wrote them with George as well sometimes. But, of course, with Davy, I wrote with Jack Davy overnight, year after year. We'd work all day, then we'd write all night. And we'd do the show next day. And I'd go home ruined about 12 o'clock the next day after 36 hours without sleep. But uh, Jack had gone to do something else. So which show was this that you were doing for Jack at the time? The club show with Jack. Uh, Jack, the club show, the Dulux show, they called it. They it depended who the sponsor was, you know. He must have worked like a, oh. like a Trojan. We made a lot of money and we spent it. And yeah. People said to me the other day, they said two things. They said that uh, you, you are a national treasure. I said, I hope someone realized before I'm a buried treasure. <laughs> well, of course, Jack squandered most of his money on gambling, didn't he, Keith? He did a lot, yes. Um, oh, I've got, I could give you a million stories about Jack in the early hours of the morning, I can tell you. One day he left, one night he left, he said, I'm going for a walk around the block. My spondylitis is worrying me so. He had spondylitis. And I knew where he was going. He was going to Tom, Tom Moe's two-up school. And he came back within a very short time. He'd lost 600 pounds. A lot of money then, I tell you. And did he ever get busted for gambling illegally? Yes, he did. And they took his fingerprints. And he told me he's terribly upset. And I said, don't worry, they'll love you for it. And of course they did. And we wrote it into the shows for months and months. Yes, I, rem I remember contestants would come up and they'd say, oh, who are you? And he's, uh, so the fellow would say, I'm a policeman from uh, Flinders, uh, you know, uh, Prince of Bridge or wherever. And, uh, you know, get a big laugh, a big audience reaction. I, uh, you know, and then Jack, sometimes they take a rise out of Jack. I remember once Jack was on the show, on his show, and uh, 
He said, and up close, he used to up close to the mic, up close, he said, and what's your name? The chap told him his name, and contestant. And he said, and um, uh, what do you do for living? He said, well, once I was a sailor. He said, but I haven't been a sailor for a long time. And Jack said, oh, you've waved goodbye to the waves, eh? And they got a bit of a laugh. The chap said, yeah, it's been a long time, no see. <laughs> That's a good line. You, having had the chance, Sir Keith Smith, to work with both Jack Davey and Bob Dyer, who was the more talented of the two? Oh, Jack was by far the more talented, but Bob was a much better businessman. And, and you know, Jack didn't have to work at what he did. Perhaps Jack's only failure was he was too successful too easily. He, he found success too easy. Uh, but Bob was a very hard worker. And he came out here with a carcass show, the marker show, really. They called it the carcass show because of the scantily clad girls. And um, uh, uh, Bob would go anywhere or do anything for publicity. He'd drop everything he was doing. He was a hard worker. I learned a lot from Bob. Tell us about the actual radio auditoriums, the shows that, uh, that people crammed into. Where were they and what was the atmosphere like? Well, you know, uh, with well, first of all, let me say, uh, according to perspective, I was doing a word from children, which was a very modest show without an audience. And then after I'd been working with Jack for a while, then I did Pied Piper at 2GB and we got a much bigger audience, 400 in the auditorium. And then I went to the country. And that's when the show really expanded, as shows do. Well, speaking of the country and the Pied Piper, have a listen to this uh, Pied Piper, Keith Smith. Here is the Ovaltine Show with children and the Pied Piper, Keith Smith. Everybody loves a child, and if you want a child's opinion, you only have to ask. Here's the man who asks the children, the star of the Ovaltine show, the Pied Piper, Keith Smith. Hi, Hi ho, Silver! <laughs> well, tonight we're in the Silver City, Broken Hill. Last week it was Warrigal in the cow country, Victoria. Tonight it's Broken Hill in the chemical country of New South Wales. It's like a cemetery here, everything good is underground. <laughs> Up here all the streets are named after chemicals. There's Oxide Street and Sulphide Street. These are dangerous systems, though. It could have spread to people, you know. Imagine kiddies with names like uh, Clary Chloride of Lime or Su Susie Sulphate of Ammonia. <laughs> but there's hardly room to put a car in the main streets of Broken Hill. But you should see the size of the parking area around it, about 500 miles in every direction. There's tons of room there. And we're here for a good cause, a building fund for a local charity. There are thousands of youngsters in Broken Hill, and I think there'll be lots more too, because today the baby bonus is better than the lead bonus. And now here come our guests, the boys and girls of Broken Hill, New South Wales. And here they are. And the first two are a small boy and a small girl. What's your first name and age? I'm Andrew and I'm um, seven. I'm Madri and I'm nine. We're going to talk about allowing parents to do things. My <laughs> word, you've got nice teeth, haven't you, eh? <laughs> you could eat a rag doll through a wicker chair, couldn't you? <laughs> I'm sure you could. Do you think fathers should have to tell mothers everything that happens to them that's gone on during the day? Oh, no, because sometimes I should because it might be something uh, interesting and, uh, and sometimes it mightn't. What does he do for a living, your father? <laughs> Works on the zinc mine. I thought they worked in it or down it, not on it. <laughs> Lovely days, Keith, and I'm sure many people would remember those programs. Interesting, Bruce, that um, a little time ago I was invited to charity function and some children there and I did a little round-up and I was amazed by the response by the adults. You know, I was amazed all over again. They lapped it up. And well, you know, that show from Bendigo we played about two weeks ago, and I had a call from somebody whose father was actually on the show, who was very ill and wanted a dub of it, and I, I taped it for him and sent it to his hospital. That's a nice, that's a nice gesture. Keith, you've always had a way with children, haven't you? Are you a father yourself? Yes, I am. I've got, uh, got two sons and five grandchildren, actually. I always associate Art Linkletter in America and yourself as the best communicators with children I know. How did this come about? 
the thing is that I was doing it long before Art Linklater, as a matter of fact. The thing was that I, I devised the idea in 1949, and uh, I was working with Bob, of course, Bob Dyer, and he was in touch with Art Linklater because Art was doing a show called People Are Funny. And um, about this time, the uh, Christian Science Monitor in America lauded a word from children as the most original radio idea since, uh, since radio came into, co into commerce, you know. And um, I wouldn't have been a bit surprised if Bob, in exchanging ideas with Art, because of his People Are Funny show, which was Can You Take It, really, had told him about a word from children. It might not have been. It might have been two people developing along the same lines. But, uh, uh, you know, logically and humanly, I wasn't always pleased when people said, oh, you're Australia's Art Linklater. You know, <laughs> I say, no, he's America's Keith Smith. <laughs> How was Harry Durth uh, to work with and for? Oh, Harry was wonderful because Harry, Harry was a bit like his character. Uh, Harry wasn't a snob exactly, but uh, he, he pined for classical things, Harry. And of course, in the show format, George Foster, and oh, no, Grandpa, I mean, <laughs> they were real larrikins. And so it fitted very well into the show. But he's a very lovable bloke, Harry. We loved Harry. Did Keith Grandpa Smith get fan mail? Did he get public appearance jobs? Oh, you're all over the place. I did all sorts of stuff. As a matter of fact, only um, uh, at Christmas time for the Till 10 show, uh, Joan McGuinness, who's since married and the show's now off the air, uh, she asked me to do it once a week, and we go do it once a week talking to kids. I went across the North Sydney Demonstration School, the education department were right behind it, and I talked to some children of six and a half years of age, and it was a riot, it really was, and I was so pleased to find I could still do it, you know. Well, with all your experience in a word from children on the ABC and the Pied Piper, were they always uh, spontaneous answers the children gave Keith, or were they sometimes primed ahead of time? No, no. All of the all of, all the answers were completely spontaneous because you can't. You know, it only takes a moment's reflection to realise you can't rehearse children. Was there editing done later to make the program tighter? A little, yes. Five percent sometimes. I'll tell you a very quick story. The people have often asked me, did parents ever complain? Of course, the answer is that the sort of children who are in the show were the sort of youngsters whose parents brought them up in a democratic home, they were allowed to have an opinion. And um, so there you are. But um, on one occasion in Melbourne, I went to a private school. There was a very nice little girl there, and she'd made some TV commercials. And I was reluctant to put TV commercial children into the program. I thought they might sound artificial. But she's such a good kid, I put her in the show. And she failed on every score. And as much for her sake as the shows, I edited it out of the tape. And I sent her parents a nice letter saying, uh, because of time, so on, so on, so on, so on. And um, I was going along Willoughby Road, Sydney, one, one day, over the crow's nest, in the car. I saw a sign on TV Times, or TV Week, one or the other, that had Pied Piper, Angus Parents. I came to a grinding stop and got a copy. And it turned out the parents had organised a press conference. They were so miffed by the fact their child had been left out of the show. And they asked me for an opinion, and I said, oh, you know, it's made a few soothing sounds. I said they might have contacted me first. And then, lo and behold, they called a second press conference. And I was asked again for a comment. And I dreamed up a beautiful comment, but it was never printed. <laughs> because because there's a printer's strike on in Melbourne at the time, I said, disappointed parents, like whipped cream, often upset over trifles. <laughs> and uh, Wonderful. And um, uh, uh, sometime later, in... Um, Auckland, I told a headmistress there at the school, and she had a sampler made and put in a frame to hang on her office wall with those words on. For, for well, you've always had uh, a way with words, and I suppose this is why you've penned some 26 or 27 books already on many diverse subjects, Keith. Yeah. Did you find that children, just to back to the Pied Piper for a moment, uh, children were different to, uh, say, uh, country children different to those in the, in the city? Children then, uh, country children were diff quite different because they had individual opinions, simply because their parents and children in the country, they had fewer distractions than kids in the city, fewer attractions too. And as a consequence, they spent more time talking with their parents. And this is a hobby horse of mine which has persisted, the importance of oral expression. Because, as I've said many times in talking to groups of people, there never was a human activity that wasn't improved by being able to speak properly and get your thoughts onto your tongue. And um, That's true, you know, it applies as heavily in the 1990s as it did in the 40s. Absolutely. Do you know something? And uh, People often say, have kids changed much? Well, back in the 40s and 50s, in the late 40s and 50s, you talk to a group of youngsters at a school, the children would want to talk, not always good, but they want to talk like mad, and uh, you could pick brothers from sisters, not by their appearance, but by the way they spoke. Every child was different. There were professors, 
and there were all sorts of kids who used their hands and were, loved dinosaurs and things. And that's the way they used to be, but they cut out doing this only a couple of years ago for Radio Australia. Um, if you go to a school today, or then, it's the same now, you go to a school and you get a group of 30 children allotted to you, to yourself, just by yourself, as I always have, you'd find that only four can put their thoughts onto their tongues with any facility. You ask them questions, they say words like excellent, unreal, fantastic, but the poor kids haven't had any practice. Uh, it's, and they all act. They're all the same, and they act as though they had the same parents, which they do. It's the television. Television. Mm. Keith, my, uh, my impression at school was that the boarders were always shyer than the day boys because the boarders came from the country. Did you find the country children more inhibited than city children? No, they are better, more outspoken. In fact, today they're more outspoken too. They're much better today at uh, speaking uh, uh, in an extemporaneous way and um, discussing anything. They're much better than city kids. You see, parents, for a variety of reasons, until recently, with 67%, I think, of the both parents going to work until a little time ago, until the Depression set in, kids didn't see their parents enough. And I made up my mind a long time ago, and I wrote in a book I wrote called A Word From Children, or How To Get Closer To Children, I think the latest one is, that if a pa parent gives a child a brush off three times when the child asks a question, I'm too busy now, I'm going to work, I'm watching something until you ask me later, it's very likely the child will never ask a question again of the parent. And uh, so a chance to get close to the kids is lost. And this is an example. And children's imaginations are not being developed either as much as they used to be. No, no family jokes, which most people listening to this who are old enough may remember. Family jokes. And acting the goat with the kids and that kind of thing. That warm feeling you get. And you still get in Britain because the weather does keep people in the house more together. And apart from television, they find more time to talk. I remember, you know, when we'd have visitors and, and they'd leave, we'd all sit around and talk till one, two in the morning, didn't we? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, when you think of the riddles that children ask, the lovely riddles, I remember so many riddles, you know, from why are there no telephones in China? Because there's so many wings and so many wongs, you might wing up and get the wong number. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Some of the beautiful ones I remember, um, uh, in the Newcastle Town Hall, 1,200 people in front of us, the child said, how do you make holy water? Well, there's a question you've got to dodge if you can. I couldn't. I said, I don't know. How do you make holy water? And the little boy said, you put ordinary water in a saucepan, you boil the hell out of it. And, uh -huh. and another, another lovely one, what do they do with old coconuts? The kid asked me once. I love that. I said, I don't know. What do they do with old coconuts? And she said, they thread them on rope and give them to Catholic elephants to use as rosary beads. Uh -huh. <laughs> Keith, we've talked about Keith Smith, the radio personality. Tell us something about Keith Smith, the author, and your 27 books. Well, actually, many of the books were written oh, way back in the 60s for kids, and they were riddle books and knock-knock books. Only recently, I was at the University of New South Wales, and a man came up to me, a grey-haired man, a middle-aged man, and very differently said, would you sign this? And it was in one of my early riddle books, covered in scotch tape, and I don't doubt it belonged to him. And he wanted to keep it. I spoke to a group two weeks ago, and a, quite an old man, an older man, he showed his riddle book to everybody proudly, you know. And uh, they were the early books, and then I wrote a word from children about the children I'd met. And uh, then I wrote children's books for children. I've written five books in the last four years, as a matter of fact. Um, two children's books. How to Get Closer to Your Children, another one is called, Finding a Second Layer in Childhood. And I've written two autobiographies, one, The Palace of Signs, all about that mad sign writing shop, and um, another one called World War II Wasn't All Hell, showing the sign of the side of war that no one else, I think, has not written about, you know. Well, you're a very talented man, both uh, as an author and as a radio man, and we've spanned a lot of years with you tonight, Keith Smith, and I think you've given us one of our... Most entertaining and enjoyable interviews on Remember When. Very pleased to be invited, and thank you for the... Gra Grandpa Smith, would you like to just say good night to everyone in Melbourne that will remember you? Yes, good night, everybody. I think I'll go to bed now. Good on you, Keith. Lovely talking to you on Remember When. Thanks, thanks very much. What about just that sign-off, Keith, the way you used to on the Pied Piper? And now it's time for children everywhere to clean their teeth, kiss mother and dad, and then... They all the kids say, off to bed. Good night, Keith. Good night. Good night. Oh, we're going home. Cause all Piper said it's time for bed for all. Sweet dreams for children sleeping. <laughs>
<laughs> well, it's goodbye to Broken Hill until next week. I think I'll be back next week. Right now, it's time for children everywhere to drink their Ovaltine, clean their teeth, kiss mother and dad, and then... Oh, Good night, all. Yeah.